So uh, the oldest club in Rochester is the Country Club of Rochester. It was founded in 1895. Anyway, a number of, of business individuals and professionals in Rochester decided they wanted their own golf course. And in October of 1901, uh, they leased uh, uh, roughly 90 acres and, uh, and an old farmhouse with a barn. Uh, along the Genesee River. You know, it was very simple. It was kerosene lamps. There was no running water in the, in the, in the clubhouse. And it was just nine holes very simply laid out. Over the next decade, the club was very successful. It grew. Fast forward to uh, the early 1920s, 1922. Um, uh, George Eastman, who founded Eastman Kodak Company, uh, along with um, uh, leadership from the University of Rochester, wanted to expand the campus. Uh, long story short, there was a land swap where we gave up the 90 acres in the clubhouse along the, the river for 355 acres here. Before we went forward with the deal with the University of Rochester, we had Donald Ross come and he walked the property and we needed his sign off as, as the current, you know, um, guru of, of, of golf architecture, still is for that matter, yeah, <laughs> that, that this was an appropriate property. And he loved the rolling hills. There's a lot of elevation changes and you know, the stream running through the east course. Um, he, he gave his approval. I felt from the first time I got on property there that the, the, the topography was really the star of the entire design. There's kind of two high points. There's one in the front nine that kind of then connects into the first part of the back nine, kind of three green, 12 green, two green, that area. And then there's kind of 14, 15, 16, that ridge there. And so those became these dominant positions to play around or, or from. And I just think he was as good as it gets at reading a piece of ground and finding ways to get great golf that maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't take as many chances as some other guys in the golden age. But you can't argue with just how enjoyable his golf courses are and how you do get to experience so many different shots in playing them. And yes, he was doing it at some level as a business, but I never, I just haven't seen anything to tell me that he lost touch with this idea that he was taking a piece of ground, figuring out the best way to move golf holes over it and making it as enjoyable and challenging as possible. I felt strongly that, number one, the greens needed to be recaptured as much as we could do to get the original shapes back on the ground, these unique corners and edges. There's some pretty wild green shapes that we reconnected to. It allowed the golf course to start to have more variety of setup options. When I arrived, either from years of bunker sand and or all these other things that had happened, a lot of the greens were kind of flipped up on the edges, and so most of the usable space was right down the center of the, of the green. And so when we started to look at the raw shaping, and you could get you know, a front right, a back left, you know, in these little edges, now all of a sudden the golf course could play in, in vastly different ways. So I thought that was huge, number one. Number two, I felt like the presentation of the golf course needed to be more authentic and better connected to the, some of the original imagery that we had from Ross's time. So that really meant bunkers, fairway lines, you know, simplifying things. And then a huge part of the work was to try to reconnect to the original par three sixth hole, which we couldn't put back where it originally sat. And I petitioned the club to put, like replicate this original sixth hole in a corner of property. So I said, hold on, timeout. 
If we took the original sixth hole, that was an amazing par three, kind of multi-layered thing, and put it in this corner, now we can put the fifth hole, which is this long par, the numbers are all confusing, I'm sorry. We can put this great long par four back where it belongs and utilize Allen's Creek and the way it moves through the property. So as the players play, uh, this PGA Championship, the fifth hole, will be an inspiration of the original sixth. And then the sixth hole will be an inspiration of the original fifth. So we had the pencil sketches from Ross when he laid out the golf course, very personalized in his hand, not, you know, not somebody from his office, what he drew, what he intended. And then we actually had some good pictures from the early 40s. The, the golf course had adjusted a little bit, but it was really into the heart of, of what it was. So we kind of put that combination together and then worked on the ground to try to represent that. How would you describe the style of bunker shaping that your team carried out? Yeah, aggressive. <laughs> Bold and aggressive. Uh, so we, there's an opening day video where there's a few shots being played and the bunkers are very steep and bold and aggressive. So these bunkers are hazards. They're not for the faint of heart that <laughs> you need to avoid them. Uh, I do not see the players bailing out in bunkers. Hopefully there are not too many complaints about them but there are gonna be some bunkers that are more maybe in keeping with an open championship where you're gonna play sideways potentially out of some positions. But we tried to get them in position where they're thoughtful and that the, the best players in the world are gonna to have to negotiate them. How many trees were removed? during your work at Oak Hill East? So I, I get the question about how many trees often, and the reality is it, it was the right number. And so I, I won't bore you with the whole story, but uh, Dr. John R. Williams, who was a retired physician, decided he wanted to take a crack at landscaping and proceeded to have, he was an amateur arborist, proceeded to have people from all over the world send him acorns from the great forests of England and Europe and Asia. And uh, he sprouted them in coffee cans in his backyard and then brought them over here and created little nurseries. Someone once asked Dr. Williams how many trees had he planted and he said he stopped counting at 30,000. And what you end up doing is you start to plant trees where they look okay for today or maybe even tomorrow. But over the decades, they start to have issues. And I think golf courses can really learn that lesson of if you want great majestic trees, you have to give them space to grow. And little trees become big trees. I love saying that. <laughs> it's so obvious, but it's the truth. And so you started to see these majestic oak trees that were once planted with a 15 or 20 foot canopy that were perfectly fine where they were planted. But when they get a 60, 70, 80 foot canopy, now they're halfway over the fairway. And that's where you have to make some critical decisions. I would say that there was um a lot of concern on the part of the membership, you know, the people somehow have an emotional attachment to, to trees and sometimes to specific trees. If you, as you walk around the course, you'll notice a lot of trees have plaques on them. And it's a way that we have been able to recognize members and events. So, you know, uh, Lee Trevino and, uh, and uh, Jack Nicholas trees had to come down and that's pretty you know that was that was really hard to do uh, but it had to happen and it was for the good of the course and you have to always put the good of the club first I know we had at least one town hall meeting where all we did was talk about trees and a lot of thoughtful discussions and wanting to make sure that we protected the legacy of, of what they had 
But the reality is that we needed to find balance. And I think we did that. So as you walk off the first green, I think the second hole starts to speak to this experience of working your way through the topography. The first hole is kind of just sitting there, you know, it, it's a good golf hole, but it, it's just sitting kind of down into the floodplain. And so when you stand on the first green and look up the hill, well, the majestic oaks that frame it, uh, the way the bunkers uh, set in the landscape along the left-hand side, now all of a sudden you got to hit a really good tee ball to get it in the right position uh, or in play, and then play to a you know an aggressive uphill green that has some interesting character to it. It's got a little bit of depth. It has an interesting corner. You know, back left is really cool. Uh, we've got some short grass now that spills off the back, so it, it has a lot of the things that you're going to face on the golf course. And then you turn to play the third hole and it is everything you got. I would never play from where they're gonna play from in the PGA Championship. Uh, the green, we did a lot of work to that green. It had become very rounded over time, um, but it's got like this uphill semi punch bowl kind of, it's just very different. Two and three really introduce you to the golf course and make you feel like uh, you all start to understand the kind of property you're gonna play over. And then I think, uh, that 12-13 is a bit of a more, um, maybe a place you can take advantage of a couple good swings uh, as you work to get to the close. You play to the, thir the 13th hole and you're up against the clubhouse. And then you kind of walk across to the 14th tee and all of a sudden you, you've kind of gotten home, but you're not home. <laughs> and so now you're staying on the 14th tee and just off to your right is the 18th green and you know that you got 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 left and it's kind of removed from what you've just played quite a bit. And it's a little bit different topography, different setting, and certainly a lot of energy in that space for the, the close of a major championship. So on 14, you have a chance to go for the green if you want, but we've made it where, to be honest, you know, if, if you fail at the challenge of going for that green, there's a lot of trouble. That green has kind of two levels to it. And so judging, if you lay back, judging how you place that second shot is important to make a, make a three. 15, we went with a very elongated green, a very deep hazard on the left-hand side. I think if you get in a weird position, you could kind of go back and forth over that green if you aren't careful. Uh, the short grass area off to the right, if you get just a little off, out of line, you're really down and well below the putting surface with a, a tricky up and down. 16 is a really cool golf hole and it's interesting that it's this downhill shot that's kind of sneaky downhill, the ball's moving right to left. You really need to challenge the bunkers and the rough on the right hand side to keep the ball in a good position in the fairway. Um, the green is probably better served coming in from that right hand side. There's some new short grass along the left hand side that you have to avoid or the ball gets away from you quite a bit. 17 places a par five for the membership, but a four for major champions. And it's everything you got, two great shots. At the green, we went with traditional uh, utilization of hummocks along the right-hand side and eliminated this bunker that was put in a, uh, quite a while ago. So now there's these rugged mounds and rough grass. And you get in there and you're definitely gonna have a unique stance. The ball's gonna be in a weird position. So getting up and down from them will be a, a challenge. And then 18, I think the combination of nerves, no matter where you are, uh, coming down the stretch and knowing that you have to hit a good tee shot and then it is all carried to that green with a huge you know, rough grass face leading up to that, that perch. Um, and then the green that we, we modified some to get a little more dimension to it. It was very kind of an oblong round thing before. So we got more Ross character and shape to that. Um, it, it's gonna be quite a close. When you look at the historically renovated Oak Hill, what, what goes through your head as you look at, at the course? What goes through my head is how beautiful it is, just how awesome it is to, to look out. I mean, you can, one in 13 runs 
run side by side, but you can look down one and then up the hill to two, you see a little bit of the green of three, and then you see the, you can see the corner with a four, five, and the sixth tee, and then you come back, and then you see the Allen's Creek running through the, uh, in and around the different holes, and uh, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, vista, you know. I'm really excited about the way it presents itself in, I guess, as authentic a fashion as possible, that it feels of a certain vintage, a certain period, that it feels like the way it was intended to be. Um, I think we found a nice balance between all the different things it's been in its life and been able to create something that can be enjoyed and protected for years to come. And so that means it's balanced with the routing, the green design, the trees, bunker placement, all of those things, we found a way to synergize it and make it work. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see how it, it holds up and what the challenges are and how the players react.